My great grandparents were raised here. I was raised in California. But my dad and mom were drawn like magnets back to St. George and Enterprise every month. And so my sister and brother and I found ourselves on a road trip every month before car air conditioning, before seat belts. We just rode in the back across the desert. And oh boy, were we excited when we saw those first neon signs come into view and said that, oh, we're almost to St. George. So this is really why I got an interest in tourism and I thought maybe we could take a road trip today together. A road trip through Southern Utah and a road trip through time. What do you think? Yeah. Are you up for it? <laughs> well, I'm really excited to do it. So my topic, from, in, from isolation to inundation, um, that really provokes a recollection that this is the really 100th anniversary of tourism inundating southern Utah. It's been about 100 years. It really was the turn of the 1900s and especially the 1920s when we became a tourist destination. So it's a fun time to look back and think and ask ourselves some questions. And here's some questions I thought we could ask on our road trip. How did the 100 years of tourism change the community that I grew up in? How did it change the identity of that community? How did it change the people of that community? How did it change the economy? Um, another question I'm fascinated by is, did we get the benefit of the bargain? We made a bargain, and now I want to know if we got the benefit of it. So let's talk about that a little bit as we explore it. And finally, how are the tourism decisions being made in your community? Who's making them? Are you happy with the way they're being made? And of course, what does the future hold? So those are the things I hope we can talk about. Um, I want to start with just one of the most provocative quotes I've read lately from Brigham Young here in 1856. And he says, I am thankful that the Lord has brought us to these barren valleys, to these sterile mountains, to this desolate waste, where only saints can or would live, to a region that is not desired by any other class of people on earth. Let that just ring in your ears for a minute. It's not desired by anybody else. So we got to come here. So what does that mean about the founding narrative? What's the narrative of our community? It's that we came here, and I know that's not all of us, but I'm just going to say, we came here for religious reasons, to be by ourselves. And now here we are, 150 years later. So you have a little different commitment to your sense of place when you think God sent you here. If, you, if you're traveling through Iowa and you decide to homestead a place in Iowa, it's a whole different level of commitment than if you are sitting in Salt Lake City, Utah, and you hear your name read out in a conference of a religious group, and you've just spent 10 years planting your fruit trees having walked across the plains and your fruit trees are about to bear fruit and you get told that you're going somewhere else and you're not coming back. What kind of a commitment does that breed in us as an origin story? Here's some things that occur to me. I think that you have a different sense of putting up with trials. And what does that mean? Here's a couple of great quotes from some of the early settlers. I'm going to focus on St. George, Cedar City, Panguitch, Beaver, Fillmore. Those are the kind of towns I'm talking about, but it can honestly apply to any of the towns. Wherever your southern Utah town is, please feel free to compare. So James Houston, the settler in Panguitch, said, folks take weather in their stride, though some candidly admit, nine months winter, three months of damn cold weather. <laughs> Those of you that have spent a winter in Penguin know what I'm saying. Less than 90 days growing season. Uh, and then Charles Lowell Walker, one of our famous St. George pioneers. St. George is a barren looking place. The soil is red and sandy, very windy, dusty, blowing with oppressive heat and hot winds. So a great attitude, but they stayed 
Even though they said that, they stayed. And again, I want to get to the level of commitment. So here's some things I, I've heard from my parents and my ancestors. God wanted us to settle here. We can't leave. Trials are for our own good. Overcoming and subduing nature is a sign that God is happy with us. So I see the landscape as a bit of an enemy. And natural resources were for us to use, not to look at. Isolation is for our own protection. We don't need others. We can be these self-contained communities. And finally, once I'm invested in it, I'm going to have a hard time letting go. So just kind of put that in the back of your mind as we go on this road trip, because I do think that uh, tourism historians will go to different places in the country and they'll talk about what makes that place attractive or what makes, why did people settle there? And it was because there was an incredibly great forest or there was an incredibly great river or there was amazing agricultural land. And so obviously it made sense to stay there, right? Uh, collective identity was also a part of it. There was a group of people that were sent all at once. You know, not just one homesteader trickling in every few months. It was everyone got there and everyone stayed. And it was in all of our interest to make it work. So I'm going to skip now 50 years into the future. And I'm going to say, what were the communities looking like 50 years later? Give all those people credit. They didn't back down. Vast majority of them stayed in every community. And remember, Brigham Young's plan was every 50 miles, it was a wagon day, wagon ride from the next community. So why was he doing that? It wasn't for prosperity. It wasn't for economic reasons. It was for defense. It was territorial defense. So you couldn't have been in St. George and said, you know, I'd rather go to Pine Valley. <laughs> it looks prettier. So I just picked two people. These could be anybody because there was one in every town. But John Day happens to be my great grandfather in Enterprise. And he was quite an entrepreneur. And so after 50 years had gone by, and his parents were the immigrants, and he was the child, and now he's an adult, and his daughter's, you know, in the third generation. And he can't, he can't guarantee that all of his kids are going to be able to stay in town in the 1900s even as successful as he was. He's the one carrying the mailbags right there. Henry Lunt is another example, Cedar City, 1902. Polygamous had a lot of wives. In this particular one, this wife was a telegraph operator. Look at her, that's pretty successful. And she's got that baby, and then look at those twin girls. I love that, Iantha and Violet, and the, and the mom there. And so brick houses, nice businesses. They've basically succeeded at what Brigham Young wanted, but have they succeeded as towns? Have they succeeded as sustainable communities where their kids and their kids' kids can have jobs and stay there? And I think you'd probably say, for the most part, it was tough. Now, my dad was the 11th of 11 kids. There was one homestead ranch that his dad and mom had put together in, up the Enterprise Canyon. And there was no possible way my dad was going to get that ranch. He just wasn't. He was the youngest, and one of his older brothers got it. And what happened to the rest of them? They had to find their own way. Now, a couple of them did stay in Enterprise, but most of them left and went to Salt Lake or California or St. George or Cedar City and then even beyond. So that's what you see at the first of the century. You see towns that are struggling with economic survival and social survival, not even to mention the natural resources. They had figured out that it wasn't going to work for agriculture. A lot of their prescriptions given to them by Brigham Young had failed as well. They weren't going to raise cotton. They weren't going to have iron ore. They weren't going to have timber and a sawmill in Panguitch. Those things didn't pan out. So what was the challenge of the 1900s? Well, as luck would have it, the car came on the scene. <laughs> and that really changed everything. And I know it's a very bad pun to say cars drove tourism, but they really did. <laughs> so let's look at some fun, fun facts. Anybody recognize this road? 
out there by the old Snow Canyon Bluffs, coming over Utah Hill. That's what the Arrowhead Trail, precursor to Highway 91, precursor to the I-15, that's what it looked like in 1929. Not a terrific road, but you can see there's been some infill, there's been some pretty serious work done on it. And so I give a lot of credit to Charles Bigelow. This article says, military scouting party hangs up important record. Charles Bigelow is a fascinating man, and I've done separate talks on him. You can, any of you can have me come to your group and talk about him. I'll get going and I'll, I'll talk all day, but he wasn't a native. He wasn't a Mormon. He wasn't really even a Utah, although he spent a lot of time here and he asked to be buried here, and he's buried right over there on 7th East. So Charles Bigelow was raised as a, a railroad guy in Illinois, and he came across cars as a 20-year-old man in Chicago. And he thought cars were just about the coolest thing ever. In the 1890s, the first cars were coming on the scene. And Charles Bigelow couldn't figure out what you do with cars to make money, but the car manufacturers could. They would sponsor you in races. And he raced in the first Indy 500 uh, in 1911. Didn't finish, made it 194 laps in his Mercer car. But that gave him the bug, and so he and his family moved out to Los Angeles at the turn of the century, and they became road promoters. And what that meant was Oldsmobile would pay him to drive this fancy Oldsmobile and set records, if you could call it that, 36-hour records of driving from Los Angeles to Salt Lake. And that was actually over four days, so they're just counting the 36 hours of actual driving. But it was a really great stunt. He was amazing at it. He was in, apparently tireless, very good mechanic, and he loved driving cars. At first he was a racer and he did like the Los Angeles to Phoenix road race, you know, kind of think of um, what around the world in 80 days kind of stuff, madcap. But later he got really excited about this idea of exploring the West and then publicizing the West and we owe a lot of St. George and Southern Utah's future to him. This was an actual military scouting party though because World War II, or when World War I was going on and he was deputized by the military to drive the car to see how we could move troops from the coast inland if we needed to in the war. And so he set this amazing record. It was trumpeted in the Salt Lake Tribune in 1917 and as I say, when he was driving his 1907 Rio, uh, he was always an Oldsmobile guy. Rio is for uh, random E. Olds Oldsmobile. He became one of the first automobile tourists to fall in love with the Red Rock Country, but he wouldn't be the last. So it's not the last we'll hear of him. But you can imagine what happened when he fell in love with it. Now, how many cars were around in Utah then? 1910, there were 873 cars in Utah. <laughs> and I love this picture with this family on the road. It does not look like a picnic to drive. <laughs> and hopefully you recognize that. That has got the Utah hill in the background. I think it's looking west. Maybe coming up the wash from Santa Clara. A lot of people tell me different things. This was from uh, the Lynn Clark collection, and I also owe Lynn a great debt. She and I found a lot of great photographs over the years that she shared with me in my presentations. But back to the cars. Most people had still not seen a car in their own town in the early 1900s in Utah. It just wasn't happening. They couldn't get there, and if they could, they left quickly. <laughs> but how does car tourism compare to railroad tourism or being a tourist in a wagon. So some of the ideas I've had are here. It wasn't practical in those train situations because they wouldn't stop when you wanted to stop. And when you got behind the wheel of your own vehicle, you set your own course and you set your own pace. And you were free to stop where you wanted to stop and stay where you wanted to stay. But you did need good roads to do it. And in 1916, Utah had 36.59 miles of paved road, and it was none of it in southern Utah. Where do you think it was? Yep, right around the temple in Salt Lake City. 
But does it look appealing to you to be on the road in that car? It does not. And that's because we needed good roads. So back to Charles Bigelow. He was part of the good roads movement in the country. And he understood what it was going to take. And the Southern California Automobile Association paid him to drive up here on the Arrowhead Trail and organize these amazing private work parties to build the road. There's no federal highway funding. There's no state highway funding. There's no gas tax. This all has to be done by you and your neighbor with your scraper and your horse. And so Charles Bigelow must have been a phenomenal motivating person because he was doing that and then he was writing these articles in the Los Angeles papers about the Arrowhead Trail and how beautiful Southern Utah was. Now I want to stop and give a shout out to Utah Tech Special Collections because if any of you have seen this, you will share my enthusiasm. Everything Charles Bigelow wrote is in a Bigelow scrapbook in the special collections right here at Utah Tech. And it's incredible. It's a treasure trove. Doug Alder and I spent weeks indexing it. The index is online. But it's a treasure trove of thousands of articles written in the 1900s about the tourist travel in southern Utah. Most of them by Bigelow. And uh, so he or his wife must have clipped everything and put it in this scrapbook. He donated it to Ralph Hafen, who donated it to the college, and I'm eternally grateful. So don't miss it. It's a lot of fun. But this is just one of the articles, and it tells you how people got excited about coming to Southern Utah in a car. And he was a very purple prose kind of guy. Ages of erosion have worn the peaks and cliffs into fantastic forms. The various strata contrast sharply in color, yet blend into a symposium of color and form unmatched anywhere. You're sitting in your house in Los Angeles, you've just bought your new Packard, you got nowhere to go, and then he tells you this. Now you want to get on the road. So here's one of his good roads days. This is just over by Santa Clara again. Uh, he's got, he had one in 1916 and one in 1917. They were in almost every community in Utah, believe it or not. From Logan to St. George, people could be convinced. They closed the schools, they closed the businesses, everybody came out. You had to be 14 years or older to work on it. It was mostly men. Even the people from the Indian tribes came and helped. And then at the end of the day, the women would serve a big picnic. And they would just spread, spread blankets on the ground and they would congratulate themselves on a job well done. Remember what I was saying about the commitment that you had to your sense of place? <laughs> I think that's a pretty unusual road construction story. And again, I'm thankful to Lynn Clark for this picture. It really captures the moment and the dedication. So 400 men, 80 teams of horses. And they did it over and over again until the road got flat. Well, they couldn't have Bigelow out there writing those articles if they weren't going to live up to it. So what were the people going to find from Los Angeles when they got here? This is Cedar City in 1910. Actually, some amazing brick buildings. Brigham Young never wanted anything out of wood. He wanted us to be sharp, and he wanted us to be permanent. So we've got some of these buildings still standing in Cedar City, which is so cool. Same with Beaver. I drove by there yesterday, and I said, that building is still there from 1900s. And brick, again. And then Panguage, they had a mail service that was a, a motor car and a horse-drawn wagon <laughs> to deliver the mail from, from Panguage to Marysville. Doesn't look like such a great road there. But this is what people would find in those early days if they took Bigelow up on their offer. And then the 1920s came. And after all the, the excitement of could we reinvent ourselves as a tourism destination, would that be the, the sign that we needed that our, our community could continue? Then all the Iron County Record and the Garfield County News and the Washington County News and the Beaver County News, they all got on board. And you can read on Utah Digital Newspapers these stories every single week. And they're very positive. You know, here's the Automobile Association in 1924 saying that <laughs> they've done a, a calculation and 45,000 tourists visited Utah. They spent 377,000 days in the state and they left $1.8 million with us. I don't know if, I, I don't know if it holds up, but it sounds pretty exciting. Many to Marble, Southern Utah. 
Now what's happening in the 20s is we are now taking some of the things that we believed about ourselves and flipping them on their head. This is not the most horrible landscape. This is not the worst place to live. Isolation does not help us. See all those origin stories start to get revisited as we reinvent ourselves around tourism. And these articles, Utah's Dixie, that's running in Washington County News, but it's being serialized the whole state and people are hearing about it. And the governors are coming down here. We knew Brigham Young had a winter home here, but governors are coming down here and they're saying, well, we want to be part of this too. And so the 20s are a time where the mental shift starts to happen. And we say, well, let's take some of this tourism dollar. Now, it's not always on our terms, right? There's still going to be a lot of compromises and we need to think about what are those compromises going to be. But for the moment, it looks like the salvation is within our grasp. So here's just some ideas of how the town changed in just a few years. Here's St. George, this is Tabernacle. You're coming down towards the east. You recognize it? Very, every, every town had the poles in the middle of the road. Don't ask me why. Sounds like a crazy idea. But the thing I want you to notice about the picture is free campground, welcome tourists, gas and oil, and then down there, you're gonna see there's an Arrowhead Hotel sign. And that's why I gave you this gorgeous picture of the internal dining room of the Arrowhead Hotel. Warren Cox built that. The Coxes and the Atkins ran it. It was right there on the corner of Tabernacle and Main Street, on the far corner, southeast corner. But the incredible craftsmanship, I could look at this all day. Look at the Arrowhead in the tile. Look at the napkins folded to look like an arrowhead. I just love it. I think everything about that's beautiful. The only problem with the Arrowhead Hotel is hotels are not going to work for automobile tourists. <laughs> but for a few years, the Liberty Hotel and the Arrowhead Hotel in St. George were very popular and successful. And so that's the 20s. Liberty opened in, in 27 and Arrowhead in 17. And they were the dominant hotels. But a lot of changes, a lot of changes from that first picture I showed you. All right, another thing that's happening is garages are needed. And so garages are being built all the way up and down the state. These are two uh, brand new garages in 1920, in July. Thank goodness for the old photographers that would stop and take a picture. I love everything about these. This guy's a Chevrolet man. This guy's a Ford man. They're both on the main street in Fillmore. This is still there. It's covered and it doesn't look the same, but the building is underneath the Sinclair station right on main street in Fillmore. If you get off the freeway, you see so much more, so much more interesting. <laughs> get off the freeway at every one of these towns. You are missing some of the best stuff. But anyway, garages were needed and these cars in the 1920s did not go seven or 800 miles. They did not go 70 miles. They had to be filled up and tuned up and pumped up and oiled. And boy, was that good business for these towns. So everyone's building garages. And this is St. George, another view coming uh, from the, the west and looking across. Now, everyone probably knows the fight about the boulevard versus Tabernacle. So I won't go into it, but it is a fun one to read about. Originally, Tabernacle was going to be Highway 91, but somehow people got the, the, their way and built things on 100 North, which became the boulevard, which became Arrowhead Highway, which became Highway 91. So what you see here is Arasa Snow's old house. It's been converted to a hotel, it's being run as the Hotel Dixie. You see the gasoline pump. You see the cafe. You see another gasoline station. All the tourist amenities are starting to come to the fore now. We're starting to really get the hang of this. And Joseph Snow, a relative of Erastus, he's saying tourist traffic over the Arrowhead Highway or Trail is growing every week. Uh, he needs more. He says, I want the construction of two or three hotels along the Arrowhead Trail this year. They were a little bit wrong about the hotel model, but they were exactly right about lodging being needed. So here's what the setup is for the parks. If you can picture yourself, you're in the 20s, you've got the hang of it, you think this tourism thing could work, it'll just be a little trickle. They did 
counts at the Virgin River down in Mesquite. That's how we know what the trail had, because the cars had to be towed across the river. <laughs> so it was seven or eight cars a day, super big traffic. And uh, I just want you to look at a couple really fun things about this. There's one on Zion and one on Bryce. We can look at both of them. But look at the population numbers of the counties that I've been talking about. So Washington County, 6,000 in 1920. Iron County about the same, Beaver County about the same, Garfield County about the same. Probably no surprises there. The visitors are very small because the park is brand new in 1920. 1930, 55,000 visitors a year. The population of the counties are pretty much the same. So you are now looking at 10 times the entire population of your county coming through. 10 times. And that's the good year. The next year in 40, it's many times more. And you can see it, and we're going to talk about these throughout the presentation, but I really want these in your head because really nothing changes until way down here. In 1960, you have a half a million visitors, and it's still 10,000 people in Washington County, and a half a million visitors every year. And you can see the other towns. Of course, where it all changes is in the 70s and 80s for St. George, and I just put this one up here to to make you gasp a little bit, 3.5 million. That's actually down because of COVID. But in 2020, it was 3.5 million, 183,000 people in Washington County. Cedar 58 and the other two have not changed. <laughs> okay, so now we've got some really interesting questions about which is the model we want to use to save our town? Do we want to do this? Do we want to do this, which is, I, th I would argue, you're allowed to get some benefit from the tourism, but it doesn't overwhelm you. Or do we want to do this? You get their money and nothing changes. <laughs> <laughs> it could be all or a combination of those. But I just love these numbers because I want you to have the order of magnitude in your head as we talk about the changes that are required. We've talked about buying you know, a few hotels and a few garages. Same with Bryce, though. Very, very similar. Really, in the 1970 time period, you're still seeing 345,000 visitors. Now, these park visitors are cumulative. This isn't one year they have Zion and the next year they have Bryce. They're still coming on top of each other. And they're by many multiples of the population and the residents. Very interesting demographically, economically, and culturally. So I love this sign. A friend of mine gave me this uh, picture. There's one in Virgin. I don't know if you guys have seen it. It's up on the top of a building. It's full of bullet holes. Why in the heck <laughs> would people do that? I don't know. But those were beautiful Arrowhead Trail signs. There was no federal signage for the trail. so. Pennzoil and an Automobile Club of Southern California would put those signs up. So this is what the road looked like then, 1920s. I just got off this yesterday. It's still there. It's oiled now. But just get off and go from Fillmore to Kanash on the old road. It's super fun. Doesn't add anything to your trip. Get right back on I-15. And then Scipio, you do have to really get over there to Scipio, but it's another time capsule. Just super fun little road trip there. The roads are in pretty good shape though, don't you think? Bigelow's good roads days have done a good job. Of course, federal highway money is starting to come in by the 1920s. But the tourists are still the focus of everybody. Courtesy and welcome for the coming tourist. I love this. He's talking to a freighter. This is in the Garfield County News. And he's saying, um, you know, that the railroad was finished and people are going to stop coming. And he says, you know, we'd be left alone sitting on top of the stump to hate ourselves if we didn't get these tourists. <laughs> he's just lecturing the people of Panguitch. And same thing back in the, in the Washington County News, courtesy and welcome for the coming tourists. Citizens should remember that as a rule, they are mighty nice people. Practically all of them members of the great American family. 
there were some foreign tourists. So the excitement is continuing to build in the 20s, and then Bigelow jumps on the bandwagon. This guy was a publicity machine. Love that picture of him. That's him later in life. But he looks like a tough old bird. He was always coming through southern Utah, met with the Chamber of Commerce every time they met in every town up and down the trail. He wrote these articles. They're amazingly detailed and illustrated. This is in the 1921 Los Angeles Express. Scenic Zion rooms as a rival of Yellowstone and Yosemite. Now he was actually right. Our visitation is quite a bit like Yosemite and Yellowstone, our numbers today. Isn't that incredible that he would say that in the 1922 Los Angeles Express? So he was visionary. Zion Park was the land of high-flung peaks, deeply graven canyons, timbered mesas. I'm telling you it's poetry. I'm just giving you a few of these, but there's hundreds and hundreds of these in that Bigelow scrapbook, and you will find them to be so fun to read. Uh, Wonders of Zion and Bryce, an examiner monologue. Every one of these, he's on the road writing it. So it's firsthand. And beautiful photographs, beautiful. Vague rumors of the wonders of this region constituted all the information readily available to the motoring public prior to 1918. Then he came on the scene. And this is just the last one, but I could honestly show you so many of these. And you can see that the tourists have a certain view of us. Very park driven, very landscape driven. So 1930s. Now we've made the mental shift. We're no longer trying to be isolated. We're no longer trying to be hard scrabble. We want to be nice. We want to be fancy. So we build motor courts. This is an early version of a motel. I hope you recognize this one. It just barely got demolished on St. George Boulevard last year. It was the Dixie Palms in its last life. And the Whitworths, bless their hearts, I don't blame them. But it just you know, broke my heart a little. Uh, and I couldn't get hold of the neon sign because they had sold it to a collector for many, many more dollars than I could. <laughs> but three families, three examples, of the building that started to happen in the 1930s. And wait, you say, weren't we in a depression? Yes, we were. But we had the Boulder Dam going on. And we had some really exciting things happening. And people felt hopeful about the future. So they continued to build. So the Covingtons built this conical court. Burt Covington, Bill Covington, a bunch of the Covingtons had a conical station. And they decided they'd put motor court next to it. Do you see these little garages? This was the model in the 1930s. You pulled your car into that garage, stayed in the room next door. You can see why the Arrowhead couldn't compete with this Arrowhead Hotel. And then that one, my relatives, Bert and Edith Milne, I give Edith credit. She was the businesswoman behind it, and she had built a, be a beauty shop. And she had made a lot of money in her beauty shop. And she convinced Bert, even though it was a depression, they should sell the beauty shop and build a motel. And they lived on the property, that was the model. And they ran it and they had the service station out front run by Bert's brother, Pete. And then this was the Hales, Brown Hale, Jockey Hale, the guy who built the Liberty Hotel and also wanted to hedge his bet with the motor court. Cafes, of course, were important. You couldn't just have a motor court without a cafe. You guys will recognize these, Dick's Cafe. Originally the cabins, Dick uh, Hammer came along a little bit later, but it was originally Fred Schultz and his wife running a set of cabins in that location on the boulevard. Big Hand Cafe, the Paces started it, then it was the Atkins, and that's where Ancestor Square is today. My mom worked there. And uh, Sugarloaf, and this is my favorite story, Sid Atkin. I was able to interview him many years ago when I was on the Dixie college board of trustees with him and this is what he told me and I think this is almost the whole presentation in a nutshell. Sid said it was a heady thing to realize that tourism was an industry where they would bring the money to us. And that, you know when he said that I kind of went huh? But then he said before that we had to ship our fruit to other products out of the community. We thought it was a wonderful thing. People would stay with us and leave their money here. 
this is like mind blowing. <laughs> and it was really important to Sid because Sid was like my dad. He was one of a bunch of Atkin boys and he wasn't going to get the Arizona Strip and the ranching operation. His dad sat him down when he got back off his mission and he said, Sid told me, he said, all I ever wanted to do was run the ranch. And his dad said, that ain't going to happen. And so they decided, well, he better buy a cafe. And it was a Sugarloaf Cafe. And he ran the one here. And his brother ran the one in Cedar. And they made good money. And of course, Sid went on to do many other great things. But isn't this a cool concept? It really says, when you think about that pioneer aesthetic that I was telling you about, you can't leave. You've got to make this thing work. How are you going to make it work? You can't truck enough peaches out of Leeds. But you can do this. And if they just get out of your way after they left your money. Cedar City, same thing. Look how prosperous the town is starting to look. It's got hotels. It's got traffic. It's, got, it's just got that feel of happening. And this is in the 30s. And then you got the El Escalante Hotel. 92 rooms. The railroad builds this. The railroad builds it to get to the parks. It's a, it's a combination parks and railroad effort. 92 rooms. My grandma and grandpa, Grant and Aline Harris, had their honeymoon there in the 1920s. So it opened in, in 23 and was there until 1970. It was demolished right there on Cedar City Main Road by the train depot. You guys remember that? I think it had quite a bit of glory. I was never inside of it. And then I love this story, Ray Nell, the Nell family in Cedar City. For some reason, we started just becoming fascinated with Southwest and uh, uh, Spanish architecture and calling ourselves L something. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. No one's ever been able to explain it to me. But almost every motel had some sort of funny name. And El Ray makes sense because it was Ray Nell's motel. But a great styling, great scene. He was a big deal in the Best Western world and in the AAA world nationally. A lot of our motel people became national leaders. That was something to be proud of. And this Chamber of Commerce in Cedar City, there was a chamber now in every single one of these towns and they were all about tourism. And I'm sorry for the fruit peddlers because they probably didn't get their due. But what was tourist school? Tourist school? Well, the chamber had tourist school all the time. And that was because you need to be educated on how to sell your community to the tourist and answer the questions. And I just love that. And I just gave you the one clip. But there, throughout the 20s and 30s, there's tourist school all the time. And then Penguich is much the same, very busy. This is a beautiful shot of downtown buildings. There's some still there. Penguich, as I showed you by the population, not really changed. Tom's Deluxe Cottages was their version of the Covington and the Conoco Auto Court and the Millen Motel, Tom Davis. And then look at Utah Oil, big fancy service station. I claim some tourism connections to Penguich. My husband is a church and his uh, brother still runs the church's Blue Pine Motel. So we had that since 1903. It was a hotel, now it's a motel. All right, so it might be coming to some of our era, the 40s and 50s, and the post-war boom. I don't know. This is one of my favorite pictures. It's not my dad, but it looks just like my dad would look. He loved his car. He loved to be sitting on the fender of his car. And every time we got to that point on the road from California, he would want to get out and say a prayer. It's just, you guys, get up and look. You can see the red hill. You can see the red cliffs. You know, he was so connected to this place. And so that's, that's the kind of publicity you would see if you're coming across from California in, into Utah. This is a famous photograph by Dorothea Lange. Uh, you guys remember probably that you were featured in Life magazine, Three Mormon Towns in the 1950s, and Dorothea Lange took pictures of us. But I just love it because it's got all the motel signs. That's, the, that's right where the Starlight Drive-In was. So now it's starting to look a little bit familiar, hopefully, to some of us, some of these things. So the 40s and 50s was really the heyday. And look how mean the state publicity people are to us. They start running these ads. How many tourist questions can you answer? Here they come. The tourist vanguard is already over the horizon. 
Let's now face the fact the flood of tourist dollars will come only if we deserve it. <laughs> now, we're back to proving our worth to stay in the community. I don't know how that happened. But this kind of advertising is in every single county paper in the whole state every month for years during the 40s and 50s. And so if any of you grew up then, you probably knew that you had to get the answers to the questions. How many miles is it to Zion? Or that famous question, do I need to change the air in my tires before I go across the desert? <laughs> yeah, there are a few people in our service stations that had a few games going on, but we did some nice things for the tourists too. We sold them those burlap bags to put on their radiators. Okay, now's the glory days of motels. And I have all my motel stuff and I've only just put a few things in here because I had to hold myself back. But I want to talk about Andy Pace, and I want to talk about the Whitwers, and I want to talk about some of the business people. So El Peso is still there. Those move-ins of you, it's still there. It just doesn't have all that fancy, beautiful neon, but it's still there. I'm so glad. I don't know if they're going to knock it down, and if they do, I'm going to have to come to terms. But see how Andy Pace changed his name to El Peso Lodge? endlessly clever. He was a guy with a slogan, a real rest in the West. And he had the Rugged West Motel across the street where Ancestor Square was. A real rest in the Rugged West was a slogan. But the slogan he's the most famous for, where the summer sun spends the winter. A gold mine if there ever was one. Andy Pace. Maybe other people claim it, but I interviewed Brooks, Brooks Pace and he told me it was his dad. So how does Andy Pace get onto this? Well, he's raised here. His dad uh, runs the, the camp that I've <coughs> talked about. And it's right there at Ancestor Square. And it's just a kind of a crummy tourist camp. And Brooks Pace and Andy uh, remember it well. And they are entertaining tourists, but not with very luxury accommodations. When I say tourist camp, it means a place where you can pull your car up and they will bring you a pot of water and you can also use that pot to pee in. And that's about it. <laughs> that's a fancy word for camping. Uh, so Andy had come a long way, but what he did was he went to law school in Arizona in the 40s. And he got this idea that the Southwest Recreational Mecca was about to explode. And boy, was he right. And what he saw in Arizona changed St. George forever. He saw air conditioning. He saw palm trees. <laughs> he saw Spanish architecture. And he came back with a lot of fancy ideas. And so both the Rugged West and the El Peso were his. And I give him a lot of credit for his visionary thinking. He was a good guy. In the Whitwer's case, they had made a, a success of the Whitwer Motel in Las Vegas, and they came up here and put in, uh, Lester and Benola put in the Whitwer Motor Lodge. It's still there in some form. And now the Whitwers still run the businesses, don't they? They're in the Abbey Inn, they're in all kinds of things in many cities. And so you don't want to rule all these people out. The tourist traffic spreads friendliness, unifies America, multiplies revenue, carries nothing away from the state except goodwill and growing millions of dollars. So the narrative is all about that. So just some fun motels, just let them wash over you. I'm not going to tell you about all of them, but Mount Air is in Richfield, Apache is in Moab, Fillmore and, and Spinning Wheel are in Fillmore. There is a motel building boom like you have never seen in this state. St. George had 27 motels by the end of the 50s. And remember, it was still a town of several thousand people. Uh, um, most of these other had seven or eight, maybe a dozen. Dixie Palms was the Milnes, Burton Edith Milnes second motel. And it was on the boulevard for quite a while. The sands is still there. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Whoever's in charge of that still lights up the sign. And the Canyon Lodge in Penguich, a great sign. Sleepy Lagoon burned to the ground a while back, but the sign's still there. I drive through Beaver just to look at it. It is a friend of mine. His dad designed this sign, the guy who runs Rainbow Neon Sign, Sleepy Lagoon. 
his dad designed that little thing to look like a lagoon and a moon and a weeping willow. And I wish I could buy it from the guy, but he won't answer the door. <laughs> the Perry Lodge and the Sun and Sand, both from Kanab, they were benefiting from not only tourist dollars, but Hollywood dollars. So they had a little bit of a fun time with that. We had some of it here in St. George. All right, every boom has to bust, right? What happens in the 1960s and 70s? And we could debate this one all day, what happened. But what really happened was people finally got a golf course here. Sid Atkin, Doyle Sampson, a bunch of people really persisted. And they got the Red Hill Golf Course open in 1965, the first golf course. And it only had seven holes. <laughs> but they opened the next two holes a little while later. <laughs> And just at the same time, this was happening, I-15. I've tried to ask people, did you see what was going to happen when I-15 bypassed your town? Did you know it? I think the, the boom was running too high. Well, yeah, there'll be some people that drive by, but everyone will still get off the freeway. And so that's 1973 when the freeway opens here through the gorge. Of course, it's not done completely until the 80s throughout the whole state, but the impact on St. George was instantaneous. And I just don't know what we could say about whether we wanted it, didn't want it, and golf replaces cotton, I loved that headline, but what I really wanted to put this up here for was this little Bloomington ad, 1968. They're starting to develop the Bloomington Golf Course, a private venture. So this is how a boom can bust. And you know what? It's a victim of your own success. You did want the roads. You got the roads. Then you got a bigger road. You wanted the motels. You got the motels. You got a whole lot of motels. And guess what? The chains came. The chain motels, the travel lodges. You wanted the citizens to come and spend their money in your cafes, and they did. And then the chains came, and Denny's came. And what does Dick's Cafe do? And you're just the victim of doing the very thing that you were so excited about doing, the reinvention, and it happens to be the key to your doom. It's not interesting. And we could, sit, we could talk about business cycles and reinvention all day, but I think <laughs> this period of time for St. George is a real pivotal time. And it really goes back to those statistics I showed you about the park visitors. And when St. George's population takes off and the others kind of stay flat. So a couple of things are happening now. We are no longer isolated. We are very good at the tourist game. We are so good that people are coming in and doing it for us. And that's why I put Bloomington here. This is not the locals. This is the ivories from Salt Lake. This is outside money. And, you know, as Red Hills as good as it was, it was a city course, and Bloomington opens a few years later, and then they just start building them, right? It's interesting how that happens. I want to go back to Charles Bigelow for a minute, because I read this story about uh, Charlie Pickett sitting as a young boy in the Pickett's building right there on, on the boulevard. It's still there. And he was in his dad's law office, Ellis Pickett's office, and he said, I remember Charles Bigelow looking out the windows of the office in the picket building and saying, Charlie, someday up to 80 cars a day will pass this road. <laughs> 80 cars a day. And he was pointing to the boulevard, to Highway 91, right outside that window. Charlie Pickett, eyes kind of got big. Wow, what's my town going to look like when that happens? Well, this is what it's going to look like. And I checked the UDOT traffic count for the Bluff Street exit. It's 46,864 cars a day, average. So let's just sit with that for a second. Let's just sit with that for a second. And we could all have theories about it, right? We could say it's the traffic, it's the parks, it's the landscape, it's, we did our jobs too well. Well, in the 21st century, tourism is looking a lot different. And it's a little bit what I was saying about the idea of 
having some of it taken away from you, the control. You know, the chains come in, and I use that broadly, but it's not just the chains. It's the outside money, really, and the developers. And so we've done a great job. We've reinvented it as experience creation tourism. So now it's not about just come and go to the park and leave. Come and play golf with your family. Come and run a marathon. Come and get a condo and enjoy our palm trees. Come and do the Ironman. Go to Tuacon. Go to the Shakespeare Festival. Go to the Quilt Walk Festival in Panguitch. Go skiing up in Beaver or Brian Head. So we've done an amazing job of that. I want to go back to some numbers here for a second. By the numbers, population, Washington County, 183,000. Iron County, 58,000. Beaver, seven. Garfield, five. Just kind of want to think about that for a minute. After all the ups and downs I've just taken you through on our road trip, I want you to think about the tourism dollars being spent in each county. This is a 22 number. I'm sorry they don't line up perfectly. But you're getting half a billion dollars in Washington County. You're getting 200 million close to it in Iron County, Beaver, and Garfield County. And that's not peanuts. For a town that never had to change, <laughs> To get 54 million a year. There's no chains in Penguin. You guys notice that? <laughs> There's no chain motels. There's just the regular old family owned motels. The same churches own them, the same Yules own them, the Camerons. It snows there. <laughs> I know. Three months damn cold weather. Uh, daily traffic counts are interesting. This is for the boulevard, it's 17,000. So Charlie Bigelow was just a little off with his 80 a day. But this is a day. And so people are getting off the freeway, but that's also a reflection of that incredible population that lives there. Uh, Iron County, a reflection of people getting off the freeway a little bit. A little bit getting off the freeway, maybe, in Beaver. Garfield, there's no freeway. That's not going to change. <laughs> You can sit there and count those guys all day long. And then you've got these double-digit growth rates in some of the places and absolutely no growth in others. I just put some of these fun things in. You guys probably read these all the time. That we're the fastest growing community in the world, blah, blah, blah. I was at a concert in Madison Square Garden. And I go to these by myself. So I was making friends with the guy next to me. He goes, where are you from? I said, oh, I'm from Utah. Well, have you ever been to St. George? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, I know a little about St. George. He goes, that's the greatest place ever. I went there for the Huntsman Senior Games. I went there for Tuacon. And I was like, what? <laughs> You're from New York City. <laughs> but they hear this stuff, and they get on the plane, and they come. All right, so what's changed? Have we got the benefit of the bargain? This is my ending. Have we got the benefit of the bargain? What were we trading our birthright for? What were we trying to do? Economic survival, we got that. We survived. Some of us did. Some of us didn't get the growth that the other towns got. What about social survival? Can our kids stay here? Yes, they can. And more can come all the time. Uh, how about the community? Did the community change? Did things about your community change in ways that you are not happy about? Yes, it did. Was it worth it? How about the landscape? The landscape was our enemy, then it was our best friend. Now it's our limitation, right? The water, the land. What are we going to do? How far is too far? This is a part where I like to quote Bob Dylan. We bargained for salvation, and they gave us a lethal dose. <laughs> he said it, not me. Uh, if you like Tom Petty, he says, too much is not enough. Those are the questions I want to leave you with, because to me, this is a really fascinating story. 
is a story of people who were good enough to stay when it was hard, who were good enough to reinvent when reinvention didn't seem possible. And I would submit in North Dakota or even Colorado, you would have left, but you didn't. You reinvented and you stayed and you made it work and you succeeded beyond your wildest dreams. I would say even Penguin was a wild success, even though they didn't get the growth in the tax base that you guys got in St. George. But let's end our road trip with Charles Bigelow. <laughs> this is his wife. She did not enjoy the publicity. <laughs> So love her to death, but she's got her hand over her eyes, like, I don't know where he's going. He's got his trademark Oldsmobile, Salt Lake to Los Angeles, Arrowhead Trail, official car. This part of the Arrowhead Trail is still there. Get off at Enoch and drive it. This is just going towards Cedar City. That's one of the old Arrowhead Highway billboards. You can always tell the Arrowhead Highway when you're driving I-15 because the poles are still there for the most part. So the question is, what is over that next horizon? What does Bigelow see for us? He, he claimed victory in his lifetime. He died in 1958. Like I said, he's buried here. But in some ways, I think we're still following his taillights. So I would love to answer your questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, I think the gorge was hugely impactful. I think it was not only the Vegas traffic, but just the interstate traffic became passable. Those of us that drove Utah Hill, maybe some of you that still do, the Utah Hill route through Santa Clara was not viable for the kind of traffic you're talking about. So you're exactly right. The time that the gorge opened, and I just don't, I don't know, those of you that were here then, did you see it coming? Did you see that people were gonna whiz through? Or if they didn't whiz through, they'd get off and go to the McDonald's right on the exit and whiz through. And that's what's happened at Fillmore and Nephi and Beaver and everywhere else as well. But I don't know that you can put it to one thing. I mean, I do think that was tremendous and that's where the bubble burst for local control of it. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, Well, um, I have, a, of course, I have a lot of affection for St. George, having, gr having grown up on my parents' stories of it. Um, my, my aunt and uncle, Shirley and Scott Graff, they reminisce about it as if it were the most magical childhood in their whole entire life. You know, nothing will compare to the 1940s and 50s and St. George, Utah. And I think that, um, I think that's probably where my sentimental attachment is. But I will be honest with you, I can go to Enterprise today. It looks exactly like when my dad graduated from high school in 1952. And it's great. I love it. Now, you ask them, and they're like, we got a corn festival now, you know. And I'm saying, OK, you got some tourism. But yeah, if we, if, I think it's hard to romanticize the past, because there are a lot more hard things than they remember. But, the part that I'm sad about is the fact that some of the decisions are being made outside the community. I think that's challenging. Yes? Did they worry about the water situation back in the 50s and 60s? I mean, to some extent, but that was when, you know, golf courses were starting up and there was no concern at all. I don't think anyone ever thought the growth would be to this level. It was still a, a somewhat of a survival analysis, and they thought they could do that. So I don't remember, those of you that were here, I don't remember reading about a lot of concerns about water or even uh, land, land use. You know, St. George land use is very haphazard. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah, Dan? Uh, on your statistic, you have the number of dollars that was generated to tourism, and you spread that across. What, have you ever run the numbers on a per capita? You know, if oh, the yeah. percentages worked out, 
Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I haven't run them, but I, you can do the math pretty quickly. If you look at those numbers, it's going to be, uh, at least in Washington County, it's going to be a lot of a lot of money per capita because 183,000, even though we feel like this town is so crowded, a lot of it is people driving through, right? This time of year especially. So really multiplying half a billion dollars through 183,000 hands, it's pretty high. Yes? I'm sure you're familiar with the movie, Not uh, My Father's Highway. Yes. Uh, it's interesting that the mafia paid for a lot of the building of that road. Yeah. Right. Highway funding is a whole other fun topic that we could get into because there are so many interests that benefit from highway funding as Bigelow explained to us years ago. He wasn't doing it because it was as fun as it was lucrative to him, Oldsmobile and Southern California Automobile Association paying him to get the cars up here. Yes. I grew up here as a kid in the early 50s and so that big sweeping Bend there coming off a bluff through the town. Yeah. That's right where I lived, okay, in Sandtown. Okay. And then I left in the mid 50s and we went to California. Right. And when I came back, we retired here 15 years ago. And you drive over the, the freeway, you're coming in, and you see outside people who have cut gashes in the side <laughs> of the Black Hill. You know, I mean, it just it, it hurts you. Hurts you physically, but, doesn't it? But. One of the things that that money has done is provided a fabulous recreation uh, mm -hmm. opportunities, uh, parks, golf courses, of course, but but uh, the rap tax and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. It, it, it's, it provides a really good quality of life for, for us that live here now. Absolutely. I don't disagree with that at all. I also think, though, that we need to remember that this is not, we're not here. Like, you know, that country slant, wherever we were going, well, we're here. Well, we're here, but we don't have to stay here. Like, we could be somewhere else in 10 years. We could do it differently. We don't have to just keep growing. And I think those are the questions I want to raise. I think the commitment that people have to their sense of place in Utah is gold. And I think we should be using that as as tourists and everything else come in. Another big time that really needs to be considered now is what about the time, was it a few years ago, when the pendulum swung and the tourists didn't go? They stayed, they moved here, they bought houses. You know, first they bought second houses, now they bought real houses. Is that what we're gonna do now? Are we gonna have a, a you know, kind of a, a move-in community, as my mom used to say? Oh, she's a move-in. <laughs> well, I don't know if that's a real word, mom. But I'm like you. We were raised in California, so I've been a tourist here. I've been a native. I've been a visitor. I've been a second homeowner. I can see all the benefits of all of it. I just don't know what the answer is, and I don't want to be acted upon. I want us to be doing the acting. Yes. Back to the water. Um, they had that actually in the before Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. They were trying to get Warner Valley Reservoir going back there. Before Pearl and Harbor. Pearl Harbor happened. It stopped. Oh like, wow. Was going around town trying to do something in Warner Valley. Wow. Back in the day. Great. Yeah. Doyle Samson was a fabulous developer of, of uh, a lot of things in Southern Utah. Other questions or comments or Did I debate? Did you just say that we don't have to keep growing? Yeah. Really? Yeah. How do you see that happening? <laughs> well, that's why I gave you the examples of the other towns. Because the St. George is not really the rule. It's the exception. What I'm trying to say is it's a, billion, it's a $3 billion industry in Utah, and St. George's experience has not been the typical. So somehow that $3 billion is going around the state to other towns that haven't had the same double-digit levels of growth for three decades. But don't you think that's the mindset of St. George mm -hmm. now that it, that, that horse has left the barn. You know, I, I don't see where growth is going to be stopped. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, just, I Take a look at Desert Color. I mean, boy. Right. Lauren? To give you a good example of what's going on in Ivan's, so Ivan's is proposing to build a reservoir. And they're finding that there's a lot of opposition to that, particularly from residents in Chanta and Ivan's 
don't want to see a, a reservoir. Okay. And Ivan City officials are saying, if we can't build a reservoir, we're not going to be able to issue any more building permits. That's a significant uh, yeah. development right there. That's a very fine point on what she's talking about right there. Will they get to a point where they will not issue building permits? And yes, and yes, I live in Ivan's, and yes, they are saying that if they don't build that reservoir, that the water district is probably going to get sued because that water, that reservoir has been in the plans for a long time, and it entails agreements made with the Native American Shibwit right. uh, yeah. reservation. Right. So, Multiple yeah, interests at stake, for sure. Yeah. yeah, one other question here. Just to throw another loop in it. Uh -huh. <laughs> for uh, people like me who are struggling to be able to afford a home or anything like that, mm -hmm. um, if we stop growing and breaking homes, there's still going to be demand for people to move here. So what is that going to do to the, the land value? And for those who are not coming here from other places where they made more income but are trying to actually survive on yeah. local. So it, it's kind of hard there too because there are people who are trying to live and work here who can't afford the land as it is, let alone if we stop developing. Right. And then that cuts a lot of that supply. There's, There's a lot of nuance to it. Should or shouldn't just no, it was one of the really interesting debates about Bloomington when it first started. Are we just going to give ourselves over to becoming a retirement community? You know, Bloomington didn't turn out that way, but that was kind of the original idea. Lots had happened in, in Arizona like that. All I'm saying is we just need to be thinking about it. I don't have any answers. I just feel like by looking at the history of it, I saw a lot of surprises on this little road trip, and I would encourage you to think about that too. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.